Uh, Expertiracy forms the basis of uh, a separate course that I teach. Uh, at least one person in this uh, this classroom uh, is is in that course, and I think one person remotely uh, at a graduate level. Um, it also forms the basis for a boot camp I'm teaching in late June. Um, and it's this, it's a very current topic. It's a topic that reflects um, evolution of, of science. Science uh, is not some fixed immutable um, quantity. The scientific fields as we know them now have evolved over time remarkably. Um, and there was a time where computer science was broad, what we call computer science now was broadly pursued as part of math or as part of logic or as part of, in some cases, statistics. Um, it was pursued in different home departments, uh, home fields of study. And there wasn't a notion of computer science per se. But over time, it came to acquire its own, its own set of, enough of its own set of uh, theory and, and um, practical tools and concepts that people designated it a, uh, designated a field of study. Um, electrical engineering was once considered part of physics. And physics was once considered part of philosophy. And science evolves over time as to serve what's considered a discipline. And it evolves over time as new opportunities become available. And one of the hallmarks of the past 10 or so years, the past decade, has been the rise of techniques which secure insight from the world through empirical evidence, through observations of the world, not just uh, in, a, in a disconnected way, but in, in on mass, um, through what's often known as big data. And increasingly, parties in the world seek to make sense of what's going on in the world through by processing massive quantities of information in trying to find patterns in that information, trying to find regularities or orderliness. And this has given rise to the field that's become known as, as, as data science over here. Um, we in this course have been exploring systems science over on the left here, this science of the whole, understanding and managing complex systems. Um, where the whole is greater than some of the parts. And what we're seeing now um, is increasingly a, a, a linkage of these two, a rapprochement, a, a sort of uh, joint synergy between these two that I like to call systems data science, whereby the tools and approaches you learned about in this class, major based modeling, discrete event simulation, system dynamics modeling, constructs that came up in that context, like state space and, and notions associated with, with the, the, uh, the equilibrium of a system and its evolution, are increasingly joined to data science issues. Data that's coming at us from all different places, social media, smartphones, and mobility data, data gathered through search volumes, through purchase records, et cetera. And this is leading to a transformation of what we know as system science. And it's also led to a, to a, to a sort of new field that I like to call systems data science, which, which really is different from either of those components, a whole greater than the sum of the parts appropriately enough. And, um, I, I work on on these issues related to health concerns, but you know similar approaches have been made um, in spheres like the business area, uh, spheres like uh, public policy, and spheres involving um, social social issues as well. Much of it is reflected in our challenges of the pandemic. You know, we are trying to interpret 
data over time. Um, and those data sources that we see over time, cases from New York City early on. Um, uh, so we have, uh, we have cases here. Um, uh, that's, that's this sort of brown here. We have tests by which those cases are found. We have the number of people uh, or the test positivity here, the fraction of those tests that are positive, the number in hospitals shown in yellow, and uh, we have the number in ICU shown in green here. And you know, an observation from the standpoint of system science, uh, well, so from the standpoint of data science, these patterns, these, this is full of patterns. There's all sorts of regularities to what we're seeing. Um, you look at uh, the, the time series associated with tests and you see a cyclicality. You see the number of people in the hospital rise and decline. You see you know, rise in the number of cases that precedes the, the hospitals. But from a system science perspective, these are all facets of some underlying system. These are different faces of a common underlying system. These aren't disconnected time series. You know, each plop down from heaven and separately as solitudes. These are these are actually different different faces of a of a, of a common system. And uh, if we seek to understand um, any one one of these, we'll find we often want to give reference to the other. So if we want to understand hospitalizations, we'll need to understand cases. If we want to understand the number of cases being reported. And why it dips and rises, we also want to understand tests because, in some cases, the number of cases that are found, like this peak here, are reflective of an increase in testing. If you go and you perform a lot more testing, you have mass testing of the population, you're going to find more cases. So these things are not solitudes. Um, and, you know, we critically were drawing on on data sources that are uh, more inclusive and more high velocity that, that bring in data more frequently. The example is wastewater where, you know, we can gather information about that gives signals as to how many people are sick across an entire city or across regions of city. So we're, we're dealing with system science in this class um, in the system science perspective. But what this lecture is about is how that comes together with data science. And data science brings a great deal to enrich the techniques covered in the class. But in turn, it is enriched by these methods. And the two synergize. The two synergize in a deep way to yield something that um, has its own methods and its own perspective. Within this class, we've seen how system structure, the structure of, of a system, say a stocks and flows, or as interacting agents and with state charts, et cetera, can give rise, or maybe it's a workflow within the street of Mexico, can give rise to regular patterns. Many of you will recognize this sort of pattern recorded in the 1700s in the bubonic plague in London, which we now know as as indicative of the spread of infection. You know, it's plateauing because limited, limited number of susceptibles and uh, in its drop afterwards as people recover and fewer people, fewer people uh, get infected. And, you know, in other cases, we have things like these cycles here in England and Wales for measles and pertussis or here for chickenpox within Saskatchewan or measles and mumps within Saskatchewan kind of rises and falls, rises and falls, reflecting, you know, a, an outbreak, drains the number of susceptibles, and then new susceptibles come in, in this case, mostly young children, children are born, come in and it builds up the number of susceptibles until a few years later, it's, there's another outbreak. These sort of patterns come out of dynamic structure. And system science, you know, it's designed to help us reason about these systems. Visualize, think stock and flow, or think uh, state charts. 
understand and reason about the underlying processes that drive patterns like this. Um, and a central way which we do that is through dynamic models, which are formed the focus of this course. And from this um, floor, uh, a number of months ago, in the opening lecture of this course, I argued that models are thinking processes. Look, models are not crystal balls. Models don't tell us what is true. They more quickly help us, though, debug when our thinking is off base, when our cherished prejudices just don't add up. When our theory about how the world works, you know, so if something in the world works, just doesn't add up to be consistent with the evidence. We can't do that in our head. If we try to do that in our head, we'll end up just with vague notions of how the system will be taken. It takes a computer to be really consistent about telling us what the implications of our of our theory as captured in the model really are. And, and by doing this, you know, we can think more consistently, quickly, and thoroughly through through our assumptions. We can, it's not so much the model tells us what is true, it helps us more quickly identify when our thinking is false. When it just doesn't, it's not compatible with what we see from the world, where it just doesn't add up to be consistent. So it's not a crystal ball, it's more like a thinking prosthesis. Just like a prosthesis lets us achieve, you know, a large part of full functionality with respect to our limitations, say here missing being missing a leg or having a broken foot or what have you, can still achieve functionality. So it is with models. They help us as thinking processes. They help us deal with our limitations of our cognitive area. And, you know, they're best undertaken by observation with the world, trying things out, observing the consequences, and, and learning from that in this kind of co-evolution. Now, models, I think you realize now, are, you know, much of their strength lies in the fact that, well, it's really hard in the world to, to be thinking about what, what we believe is going on in the world and to understand the degree to which it's consistent with the evidence. By running a, a, a simulation model, we can actually test it. The model goes from this kind of theory captured in the model to what would you would see from the world? What, what, what output you would expect to see? Um, and uh, we can also, of course, reason about what if, what if we were to change things? How would that change what we see from the world? Um, now, in this class, though, I, I spoke a great deal about the strengths of these models and varieties of models, um, and I spoke about what they bring to the table in terms of insights. But, you know, if we want to critique ourselves and, and, and look to improve things, which we should always seek, um, there's a number of, of limitations we need to, to recognize, a number of weaknesses, a number of areas where we need to grow. One of them is the fact that traditionally with modeling, you build the models and then you use it for insight. You build up this great model, got the latest evidence in it, and then you start using it to give recommendations or to anticipate what's coming or to not ask what if questions, et cetera. But the problem is that when we do that, the model is quickly becoming obsolete. It quickly loses its currency. Things happen in the world that weren't anticipated in the model. And as a result, the model starts to get dated. Um, we can realign it with new evidence, but it's a fairly, it's a fairly laborious process. A, a second and related issue here is that the model will increasingly get disconnected from and, and divergent from what's observed in the world. Um, you know, things are, are playing out in the world, and even the best model, model made with the finest evidence, 
the, late, the latest understanding, it's not going to capture certain features of how the world behaves. There are these ugly facts that inevitably we're going to have oversimplifications, things that are omitted, approximations in it, but we're also going to have things that just weren't anticipated. A new variant comes about, a new vaccine arrives, a new clinical treatment, you know, uh, a, a very effective antiviral, for example, uh, such as Paxlovid. And there are stochastics, just chance of X. Shortly after my secondment, in the opening weeks of the pandemic, after the province had acted, not merely once, but twice, within hours after watching modeling presentations delivered by me, um, there were the series of, of the first few clusters of cases in this province. I remember three very clearly. One of them was a snowmobile rally, which occurred up somewhere towards PA, and as I recall, and um, a bunch of snowmobile enthusiasts got together and and, and did their thing. They they went on their snowmobiles, but then they had a gathering as part of the snowmobile rally where food was served and uh, beverages were served. The person who served the beverages and the food, one of those persons, unmasked, of course, was infected. And by serving the food, that server also served up COVID. They, they infected large numbers of people there. I think it was 18 people or something were infected by this by this event, in, in large part because of the server. Who could have known, you know, the snowmobile rally would come about, led to this sudden spike in case. And in other cases, a set of, a set of medical uh, personnel, predominantly physicians from this province were invited to a bond spiel held in Edmonton, a curling tournament. Are invited to, to throw the rocks as, as they do in curling. And um, a colleague of mine was one of those people, a colleague of mine with whom I was leading the modeling. And she was actually invited to this. And she said, uh, despite knowing a bunch of people who are going, despite having strong Alberta connections, she could have reconnected with. And uh, despite many of her colleagues being there, she said, maybe wouldn't be a good idea. And guess what? Someone also came to the to the bond spiel who had just flown back from Brazil, if memory serves me. And I guess they had just flown back from overseas. And they brought a gift with them in the form of infection. And so they transmitted it to all these physicians who brought back and brought into our province COVID-19. Another case occurred in Regina General Hospital. I think it was he was in the hospital. Uh, a woman um, who uh, who was suffering from uh, homelessness. Uh, she came in and uh, she was uh, very ill to her stomach. And the physicians and the emergency room were working to aid her, etc. And they didn't realize till after the fact that she had COVID. This was an atypical presentation of COVID and, and infected a large part of the emergency room staff. These are stochastic events. You know, it would be a fool's errand to try to predict exactly when there's going to be an outbreak of, you know, a, 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 a outburst of infection. Um, just as much as you could have the best weather model in the world, but you're not going to predict within a minute. Um, you know, based on data from the beginning of the year, you're not going to predict to the minute when you're going to get snow. Or you could have the best hydrological model in the world, you're not going to predict exactly when waves will rise and fall on the Saskatchewan River. That's, that's um, not something that is consistent with the limitations of models. A third point is that traditionally, when we inform these models, there's we often run into a shortage of evidence. 
And a lot of the time, it's issues of evidence involving human behavior. As you'll hear on Thursday from Kurt Kruger uh, speaking about the provincial modeling efforts. One of the biggest challenges for that modeling is understanding human behavior has changed over time. Typically, there just isn't enough information. And this cuts across many different areas. How people make decisions and, and what information is available to them at that time and, and a lot of aspects of their, their interactions with others. So system science, the models that we build using the types of techniques explored in this class have their, have their challenges and their barriers. And if you look closely, many of these relate to issues of how they relate to things in the world, what's actually playing out, as might be evidenced by data from the world. Obsolescence means that the model is no longer a reflection of the patterns we see in the world. It, it, it may have captured the initial state as of two weeks ago, but not now. The situation has moved on. Divergence from what's actually happened. Well, we may have observations from the world that are increasingly divergent from what we see from the model. Shortage of evidence. Well, this is about evidence from the world. And we have hope of turning to data science for, for understanding that could inform those gaps. So let's talk about it. Data science is basically a, a, a broad field focused on mechanisms, processes, principles, and practices, infrastructures, tools, and methodologies to draw insight from data. And much of the drive of energy and investment in computer science these days relates to exactly this. Whether it's creating uh, large scale database, distributed database systems that allow us to, to handle massive quantities of data. Um, the infrastructures like uh, Apache Spark or Hadoop that allow us to process that data effectively or tools for, for analyzing the data, um, processes involving machine learning, for example. Um, much of modern computer science um, is, is seeking to advance data science as we know. It's not exclusive to computer science. These boundaries shift. Uh, statistics has much to offer here, for example, um, as do some other domains. But there's a particular focus here on big data, data that actually ends up straining our, our systems. And in machine learning, it turns out to be a key analysis tool here. Now, the term big data um, is, is a term that's had a lot of hype in the system. It's had a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of things that are more image than substance. But there really is something there. Big data is defined first and foremost by the four Bs. Um, this is Google's definition. I'm rather partial to it. It has high volume. That's the big of big data. It has high velocity. That's the big thing. You can look at dynamic models. Dynamic models are all about velocity. They're all about behavior over time. And the fact that we apply velocity from big data, meaning it comes in quickly, to get you thinking about, gosh, could be compared with what we have from the model, what the model expects. But more than this, it tends to apply variety. A given data source, like smartphone, can provide data on all sorts of things. We have our smartphone-based data collection system. That's it. It's used in hundreds of studies worldwide that came out of this university. And in front of the smartphone, I can collect data on screen time. I can collect data on my steps. I can collect data on estimates of, of what activity I'm engaged in, walking, sitting, standing, um, biking, swimming, what have you, unlike in a smartphone for swimming, um, but for a watch, uh, quite possible. Um, it can also give an understanding of contact patterns. 
where I am GPS wise, uh, a wide variety of different things can be picked up here. What apps I'm using, um, et cetera. So a given data source can often give a variety of types of information. And the final thing is veracity. Traditionally, when they ask people, who did you have contact with? They can remember a certain amount of it, but it's very burdensome. And often they end up not bothering to write down certain contacts or forget. <laughs> Uh, and so often what they report just has a lot of inconsistencies with what actually happened. Same thing is true with physical activity levels. How much people tend not to be very good at reporting them. What they eat, even people's weight, kind of interesting. Um, there's different patterns of distortion associated with weight um, that people make. Um, and big data often involves physical measurements, measurements of location, measurements of contact, measurements of things like weight or, or, or physical activity that are less subject to recall bias and, and recollection and, and delivered distortion. Um, now, in machine learning, I don't know how many people have taken the machine learning course, but if some of you still have a year to go, I'd suggest you, you think about it. And there's many components that machine learning brings to the table to make sense of data. Some of them are inference tests to try to infer you know, what really is going on here. What's the, what's the value of a missing variable? Some are classifications. You know, is this person have depression or not based on on smartphone based data collected or from social media posts? Um, uh, engaging in, in image recognition or finding hidden hidden structure, etc. And uh, there's a wide variety of, of tools that machine learning brings to perform these tasks, and they're based on some of them are Bayesian statistical techniques, some are what I call kernel methods, statistical learning. Some are based on uh, deep learning and, and, and structures that, that draw neural networks and connections to approaches. We can do amazing things. And our, our lab here has done a great deal of this with, with different types of, of health data, whether it's data from smartphones, data from wearables, data from tweets, um, looking at people's uh, comments online to try to recognize cases of say flu or cases of, of COVID. And we can sort of assess um, the success of models, machine learning models in classifying things or predicting things or inferring values. And that's good. Um, and some parties have always attempted to try to use methods that are statistical in nature to try to fill in the gaps, to try to, for example, project forward what cases would do for COVID over time. Projecting forward, you know, saying what's the trend for these. But if you think about that from the standpoint of this course, you should of course be recognizing that. The number of cases is driven by structure. It's driven by some interaction between susceptibles and recovered and effective. And, and just projecting forward numbers uh, is going to fall short in capturing certain drivers of the system itself. And not surprisingly, when applied absent system science lens, there's a number of challenges machine learning. One is how to explain these patterns that are seen, how to explain this relationship that's found, these patterns that are found. Often they're undertaken on a very data set specific basis. And there's often great difficulty reason, reasoning about what are called counterfactuals. What would happen if this other thing were true? And uh, the danger here is that when we're looking at data from the world, it's a bit like looking at out the rear view mirror of our car. We're interested in what's coming up front, 
But what we're seeing is what has been produced, not what is coming directly. And if you're going around a racetrack, what's behind you is probably a pretty good indication for what's ahead of you. But if you're going off the road, if you're dealing with a pandemic for the first time, if you're dealing with you know, uh, an outbreak uh, in some particular year, it's probably going to look quite different from the past. And the danger is data from the world is often contingent, it's contextual. And it may not, these patterns that we see may not carry over. It depends on things in the future being similar to those in the past. These associations that we find in data, the relationship between X and Y often reflects underlying system state that may evolve a lot. So uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, is this by epidemiologist Phil Zucker. And what he said is, Data without theory is madness, and theory, theory without data is math, and data without theory is madness, put it in that order. Um, if we don't have data to substantiate theory, you know, how do we have any confidence whether or not it's true? Uh, if, if we have data without theory, we don't know which of the patterns are, are really uh, substantive and, and, and reflect uh, the structure of the system. To what degree they're, they're just chance, uh, chance events, to what degree they will continue to apply. So systems and data science have, well, seemingly two disparate areas. They have a lot of common. And this is what modern techniques are allowing us to take advantage. Both of them seek resolution on what's happening over time. This is the, the second V of big data is velocity. They're often interested in what's driving the system. What is it that's giving rise to data? Traditionally, that wasn't as big a, a focus in data science. You know, drawing lines between data points, for example, doesn't ask about why we're seeing these patterns. But recently, it's been a big interest. Cause capturing causal structure has been a big, big point of research and interest. Another interest uh, in this sphere, um, which they can both address, is the ability to capture longitudinal behavior at, at an individual level um, and capturing context, rich information about context, location you know, someone's recent history online or, or their level of interaction with the phone, who's around them, et cetera. And reasoning about interventions is an area where both are, um, both have, have some desire to be able to address the challenges. So data science and system science have some really big synergies. Data science can be enhanced by system science and by person. Because you're most familiar with system science, I'm going to start with the last. System science um, by itself builds these models. And the models need to be informed by data. In this class, we talked about parameterizing the model, putting an assumption. And I asked you to watch a video, you may remember, on calibration. There, the model's behavior is being compared with what's being observed in the world. You know that that's going to fly. Um, so here, we're seeking to ground our models in evidence. Um, and it turns out that we can do a lot better than calibration. And uh, there's a set of techniques um, which can take it much further than um, they go by various names, approximate Bayesian computation, MCMC, particle MCMC, and, and particle filtering for, for driving the, the state of the model. So we can ground our model on data and, and actually clue it in to what's going on in the world on an ongoing basis, correct it, ground its assumptions, update its assumptions automatically on an updated basis. 
We can challenge the ball. When data is coming in frequently, we can challenge it with this, with this data. We can test it and, 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 and hold it up against this crucible of evidence and test whether it is wanting and whether we need to, to correct it. Um, it turns out that in many cases with big data, think smartphones, we can get understanding very, very fine grained about what's going on along particular, particular lines of influence, say influence from one agent to another, um, which is, is really very valuable. And the data we're collecting from the world at an individual level or a, over an overall level can serve as really helpful data for, for parameterizing and calibrating a model. Uh, and in general, data can help us build better model structure by, by informing our assumptions. And finally, there are these uh, techniques which are, which are being involved and which we've been involved with to deduce causal influence from data. So when you have big data coming in, maybe it's social media posts, maybe it's search data online, maybe it's from smartphones, you can actually use that to try to understand what's driving what, or whether a pattern is driving the number of people coming in the emergency room, for example, over time, et cetera. Now, so that's system science being empowered by data science. It can really be turbocharged with data science. Data science, on the flip side, can be empowered by system science. Data science traditionally has looked too much at data sets in isolation. And system science teaches us, most foundation, that these data sets are facets of the different bases of, they're different components of an underlying system. They're just different elements of this underlying system. They reflect different portions of the system. And that perspective allows us to reason about the underlying system, why we're seeing the data, and, and make sense of it together. And it turns out that would be really important. One of the principles that we learn in systems data science area, and there's, there's a huge problem of mathematical understanding and scientific observation, is that when we observe data from the world, if we're dealing with a situation in the world that involves a coupled nonlinear system, which is generally the case, think infections, for example, data from the world on any one piece of the system actually tells us about many areas of the system. This may seem strange, it may seem implausible, but it's really true. Uh, if we observe one piece of the system, it tells us about the other. For this class, those pursuing assignments undertook uh, an exercise looking at gophers and coyotes. Everyone will remember that. Remember that? Okay. And I would claim that if you had data over time about gophers, you could deduce something about coyotes. The coyote population. I'm going to give you an example. Maybe you have observations that suggest the gopher population is growing like crazy. That would suggest to you that probably the ratio of coyotes to gophers is quite small. There's not enough coyotes around to control the gopher population. So it's growing like crazy. If you saw the gopher population dropping like crazy, you might suggest that fewer coyotes, um, that, excuse me, that there's more around, that they're, they're eating the, the gophers at, at high rates. But similarly, if the coyote population was dropping like crazy, it would tell you something about gophers, that there's not enough gophers around to feed, feed the coyotes. So information about one portion of the system will tell you about other portions. You only learn how to listen, listen to its whisper. You can actually hear what it's telling you about many things. And this is true mathematically. In the run up to the closing minutes before this class, I was trying to figure out to what degree we run a little example. Unfortunately, it's not fine, but um, I will post it 
and uh, I'll point out to you on Thursday, I'll make a few remarks about that. But fundamentally what it shows is that in a lot of systems, data that we think of as being one type of data will actually tell us about a large portion of the system. If we just look at it in the right way, just the right lens, we can see large parts of this system as a whole. We can have information about large portions of the system. This is a theory called, uh, it makes use of a technique called delay and delay. Um, now, now, data science traditionally is backwards looking. It looks at data that has been produced and tries to draw a pattern. I analogize it to looking at the rear view mirror of your car. It's about data that was produced, doesn't tell us what's ahead, doesn't tell us if those patterns that we see will still hold. Are they robust? System science is all about reasoning about those sort of things. Why we see these patterns over time, how they will change if we if we change certain parameters, for example. That's what system science much focused on. You just have to run your model with different scenarios, right? You've all seen that. So system science allows us to reason about counterfactual kind of systems, systems we haven't we haven't seen before. Um, it allows us to reason about how evidence we see from the world. What, what does it imply about the system uh, as a whole? Um, there's many other uh, components here but that that uh, system science can bring, but I want to want to talk about a few basic principles here um, associated with it. And if we have time, talk about some of its exciting features. Um, so one of the needs is is to reason about the the underlying system when understanding data. Um, the idea here is look, observations come from an underlying processes and, and those processes are dynamic. Um, and here in system science, we represent those processes with models. Um, uh, and the models typically capture causality and they let us ask these what if questions. Another point here is that different data sources are, are reflective of this underlying system. And when we see data from the world, whether it's data, uh, about veterans' interactions with smart dog, with uh, with uh, with companion uh, animals or or support dogs, or whether it's different parts related to uh, outcomes associated with opioid use within our society and opioid-related deaths. These relate to different components of a system. The observations we have from the world are often about certain flows, certain stocks here, or certain functions of those flows and stocks. Um, and system science provides us a way to sort of reason about this and, and to relate observations from the world to those areas. This is going to be key for some of the, the, the combinations of these techniques we'll see in a minute. Um, system science traditionally has looked, uh, or much of system science, to models as learning tools. And these tools can be more effective if we learn quickly from data about the world that's richer. Um, and a particularly big opportunity here is to learn from interventions. We anticipate with the model results of our interventions, and we see those results here um, over time, and we, we, we seek to understand what are they telling us about the system. Okay. Um, one of the more exciting avenues for applying these tools has been the rise of what are called filtering. Now, for most people on the run, filtering is going to mean throwing away things. It's going to mean or throwing things away, filtering out things. But that's not the sense that's being talked about here. Filtering techniques provide a set of methods for allowing us to to take a system which is evolving with some uncertain, some stochastic system. This uncertainty over time. 
randomness overcome. And it allows us to take a system like that, observe data, and, and estimate what's the true underlying system uh, situation, the state of the system. So I asked you to watch a video about calibration. In calibration, what we're doing is we are taking a model, we are running it, and we are comparing the results against what we see for the world in data, adjusting parameter values to identify the parameter assumptions that best match that data. The single best parameter assumptions that best match the data. See, the idea is we have some parameters and we're the values. And we run the model and we compare it with data and we adjust those parameters to model consistent as close as possible for reproducing the data we have in the world. And we use those parameter values, the ones that give us the best fit. But that tends to lead to this sort of thing. It tends to lead to a situation where we have data we want to match. And the model maybe does a decent job matching some patterns of it. But in other cases, it, it can't. The particular problem for going forward, we start to see a model doing pretty reasonable things, but diverting from the, the actual observations. And sometimes these divergence from these observations are quite large. This is not a filter test. This is a caliber. Even the best parameters will lead to a model that typically has, it's unable to sort of keep up with the changes that are occurring in the world from what was expected. A filtered system is like that shown on the bottom. This shows one particular example of it called particle that we apply or world leaders and applying this certainly in the health sphere and in, in social spheres. And here, what's going on is the model is being kept always consistent with that new data. So new data comes in, the model is being clued into it. The model assumptions are being updated and tweaked. And the model state is being figured out to be best consistent with the data. Now this data is often only about very small limited components of the system, just a few components of the system. But the model's state possibilities, um, only few of them match up against it. And so it clues it in and regrounds it. It identifies what is probably the situation that makes sense in terms of what the model's dynamics allow. And there's a, a way of doing this that's uh, quite rich and quite beautiful that involves running the model with different hypotheses about what's going on at the same time and letting those compete with each other to explain the state. But it leads the model to, to sort of interpret what's going on um, in a way that is consistent with the model evolution but also consistent with the data. So particle filtering approach clues a model in to what's actually observed in data. It recognizes that the model is fallible, it's limited, it has its issues. It recognizes the data is fallible, it's limited, and it arrives at a consensus estimate for this. And what we can see, and this is for measles data from here in Saskatchewan, is for example, these are months here on the x-axis. It actually clues it in very, very well um, over time. And it allows it to track what's actually going on over time. Now, what's significant here is, it, is that it allows it to track in a fashion that it's estimating the full state of the model. So it's, in order to track these observations, it's actually, estimating over time in a way that's consistent with the model, what's the underlying situation in the world in terms of the values of all the stocks 
stock S, stock E, stock I, stock, stock sorry, R, uh, E, I. So it's actually re-estimating what's going on in the world with every new data point in a way that is true to the model, but also true to the what's observed in, in, in the world. And we can do this even more sophisticated ways with, with estimating parameters too. Um, the result of this is kind of a population tomography. It kind of understands what's going on throughout the entire system. So think of it as like a simulation model where we're constantly recalibrating at the group level. But we're not just calibrating parameters, we're re-estimating the state of the system. The underlying number of people, say, who are in the S, the E, the I, the R set stocks so that we, we estimate them in a way that's most consistent with the observations from the world. One type of observation or many types, regularly measured, only episodically measured, et cetera. Very, very powerful technique. Now, what's, uh, I, I'd like to analogize it to a weather, a weather model. So we all depend on weather models to decide, say, whether it's safe to drive from here to PA or down from Regina on a given day. We're relying on weather models. But the reason that those weather models are so effective is not merely that they're very, very sophisticated models, but that they're constantly updated with data. If we had to use to predict tomorrow's weather, to decide whether to drive for Regina tomorrow, based on data from the beginning of the year, a weather model whose latest update is the beginning of the year would be full hard. Instead, we look for a weather model to be always re-synced with what's actually happened so that we can look forward to what's going on next hour or tomorrow with much greater confidence. Now, I wanted to take the, the time here, and it looks like we will, um, we'll have a little bit of time in order to show you, I was hoping to get this slide in here, but uh, I didn't, didn't have time to give a sense of um, what's involved with, uh, with these models that, that recalibrate. This is a talk I gave yesterday, code gave with a, a lead from um, the SHA and, and a UK colleague involving, involving some of these methods. And one thing here that uh, I wanted to, to show you is when we engage in this sort of uh, particle filtering, this model uh, adjustment with particle filtering, um, we can predict forward in, in very effective ways. So having regrounded it, we can anticipate what's coming with much greater reliability. So here we have the current, the present situation, that's this red line. And all this data over here has been incorporated by the model. So that type of data, it's understood. It's learned from it. Learned in terms of uh, adjusting evolving parameter values like contact rate assumptions, um, what fraction people actually who are sick actually go get tested. But then going forward here to the right of the bar, it's predicting. So it's learned from what's going on in the left and it's predicting here. And what you can see is that it's incredibly effective actually in anticipating what's coming up. It's anticipating, for example, this outbreak some months ahead, well before it ever happens. It's anticipating this outbreak down there. Again, well before it, it actually happens. And uh, this is true against a wide variety of, of other circumstances. Um, this, for example, shown uh, you know, anticipating uh, an outbreak in the immediate future right before it, or here anticipating partway through an outbreak when it will come down. So these sort of techniques are not just dynamic modeling by itself. It's not just running a model. No, 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 it's running a model that's constantly challenged by and regrounded and updated by in its assumptions and learns from data from the world. I don't have time to tell you about the details of this. Um, 
What's actually going on in each of these? When we run a model like this, is that we run hundreds of thousands of different versions of the model simultaneously. I'm oversimplifying it, but the idea is at the same time we have different hypotheses all running in the model. We have hundreds of thousands of them. Some of them think there's more susceptible, fewer effectives, more more recovered and and the moderate number of uh of exposed people others think no there's tons of susceptibles and very few of the others etc and these try to compete to explain the data and the ones that are consistent with the data they tend to get proliferated they are fruitful they multiply and we invest more in them and those that are inconsistent with the data tend to die out. And the result of it is a model which is always learning from what's being observed, learning about evolving parameter values and learning about the state of the system. And that allows us to have been a model that is that is just totally clued in to the latest evidence, much as a weather model we will have learned from the fact there was a snow, you know, skip uh, three hours ago. And use that to anticipate whether snow is likely in the next hour. So these models are not merely simulation models. They're simulation models with machine learning. And you may not be surprised to know that these models have been one of the key points of value delivery we made to the province and to every province in Canada and the First Nations reserves throughout nine provinces throughout the pandemic. So we have these methods that combine machine learning with dynamic models. The dynamic models here are system dynamics models with some stochastics. The machine learning is, is a tool called particle filtering or a tool called particle on CMC. But in both cases, they provide this incredibly effective way to update the assumptions of the model in real time and look forward. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an effective, immediate, actionable, and powerful way of combining system science and data science. It learns over time from the evidence. It doesn't assume the model is perfect. It corrects the model and it corrects it with new data. This is like giving our models eyes, taking off the blindfolds of our models. Normally we build a model, we put a blindfold on it, we just use it from then on, and we trust that it's still representative of the situation in the world. This is like taking off that blindfold and allowing it to constantly clue itself in to what's going on around it. And this gives our models much, much more power. It's a little bit like uh, for each of you here, trying to go from your home to this classroom. You know that way very well. You know where the bus stop is, you know, how to get from class to reality here, you know how to walk in or hike in or whatever you do, right? In. But it would be crazy to do it with your eyes closed. There's too many uncertain things. You have a very good mental model how to do it. Excellent, very robust mental model. But if you try it with your eyes closed, you'll end up in a world of hurt. You'll try to walk across, call a drive, well, the stoplight is not illuminated, or well, the, uh, the walk light is not illuminated, or you know, you'll go through a red light and get T boned by a car, or what have you. Um, so, so, you know, in day to day, life we have models but we expect them to be always updated with evidence from the world always clued in to really what happened to correct our mental model to clue us into where we really are uh, we don't walk around with our eyes closed for a reason and some of this with these models so when we talk about models of the province these days we're talking about two major sorts of models number one the model you hear about on Thursday, agent based hybrid method together with discrete events in your life, and you'll be hearing about it from Kurt Um, 
And that's an amazing model for asking what if questions at a detailed level about, about choices that the province has or about service delivery challenges that the province has. That's one sort of model. That's an any logic model that you could run and, 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 and use as a familiar quantity. The other type of these models that combine system science and data that always update the model with the latest evidence. We don't know how to do that effectively yet well with agent based models. We're working on it. The next generation of students in my lab will probably be, be working to figure that out. But these these models work very, very well with, with system dynamics models. And that's what we have in place for the province. And that's what we've had in place for all the provinces of Canada and what we report on daily. So our daily reports to the province, which give updates are based exactly on this. We have an automated system built by computer science students that every day someone just gives it data, it'll all run, it will run these models, we'll get the output, it'll package it up and send it off or upload it or what have you. Day in, day out, every province across Canada for most of the pandemic. So system science and data science together offer a formidable combination. And that combination is a defining feature of the next bunch of years. So, you know, a few take home messages from it. I've traditionally practiced system science and data science. Uh, both have important roles to play, but they have, they have shortcuts. System science and these modeling tools have limitations as well. The, the assumptions that go into them, the fact that they get increasingly outdated, diverge from what we see in the world, et cetera. But it turns out together they're complementary. If we can use them effectively in a savvy way together, they're complementary. And for the most part, they're taught separately and applied separately. But this is one of the few places which really combines them together effectively. And much of our success in the pandemic and what the National Health Service yesterday in England was interested in is how we do that. How we use the machine learning together with this model. And systems data science supports this understanding that can help us reason about counterfactuals, um, learn faster and deeper from new evidence, uh, recognize the system wide implications of evidence, and constantly recorrect and challenge our models so we can learn more effectively. Um, this is kind of a hallmark of the current era where. Big data is increasingly available. Data from wastewater, data from social media, from search volumes, data from smartphones, mobility data, confidence data, can clue us in so we keep our models more honest and more, more capable of reflecting the actual evolution of the situation. That, in many ways, marks a, a key component of the evolution of the technique seen in this class. Thursday, you'll be hearing about the other big component of it in the form of uh, agent-based and discrete event simulation. And I hope you'll take advantage of the guest lecturer's uh, presentation to ask, ask some questions. And I'll be with you on Thursday to help wrap up with some messages from the course and, uh, and set the stage for the next few weeks where we'll get together for, for exam review. So thank you very much. Um, best of luck with other elements to the end of term for you. And I'm glad to hold office hours now. Thank you.